Good morning. Uh, welcome to Sadafa Libraries, Chats with Champions. We're happy you're all here. Chats has a 15-year history of presenting programs that span the interests of all in the community. Our next two chats will be presentations by two award-winning main authors. On Thursday, August 11th, we will welcome Tess Garrison. And on Tuesday, August 16th, Monica Cooper will be here. Chats is sponsored by Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. We're pleased to have with us this morning Dr. Robert Snyder, president of Iowa Institute. Dr. Snyder is responsible for working with island and remote coastal leaders in Maine to identify and invest in the innovative approach, approaches to community sustainability. He oversees the Institute's efforts to share solutions with communities that are experiencing similar challenges to their sustainability elsewhere. In addition, he works with the Institute's energy, fisheries, education, community service, publications, and economic development staffs to structure responses to emerging challenges faced by these communities along the coast. He writes a monthly field notes column for the Working Waterfront newspaper. It's my pleasure to introduce Rob Snyder. Thank you, Karen. Well, thank you all for coming this morning. I was really looking forward to learning who the champions were here, and I get to chat with them today, so I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, the presentation that I put together is really structured around um, a couple of different things. One is to get a sense for uh, the views that you have on the future of your own community and what you care about about the future of this place, and um, to talk a little bit about kind of how I came to the coast of Maine and how it relates to kind of my broader experience of the world. And then to also uh, talk about what I see as some of the opportunities and challenges that are facing us as a coast. So it's, it's structured in that way. Um, I understand we have about 45 minutes for a talk and 15 minutes for questions. Um, I will gladly take questions along the way. Um, and if that means we have to truncate parts of the talk, I'll just do that on the fly. It's not really a problem. Um, but I really just want to uh, have a discussion about our coast, but really with a sense of looking at it with very clear eyes, both the challenges, but also with a sense of optimism, which I think we're in a very fortunate place to be able to think through an optimistic lens right now when we think about our coast. So that's really the overarching structure of this. Um, I work at the Allen Institute. I'm the president of the, the president of the organization. I have been in this role uh, three years. I took over for Philip Compling and Peter Ralston, who some of you may have met over the years. Um, and this is our mission statement. We work to sustain island and remote coastal communities. We exchange information and experiences to further the sustainability of communities here and elsewhere. This chain, this is this might be surprising to some of you that it actually says remote coastal communities. It, um, I don't think many people realize that the organization, as of the transition in leadership, had a quite a discussion about whether or not there could be strong island communities without a strong coast. And kind of came to the realization that we needed to be looking for the ways that we're working in island communities that can also be relevant to and supportive of community efforts along the coast of Maine. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this whole second clause just makes it really hard to recite out loud. And um, also, uh, I have to say, it's more about this fact that the Island Institute wants to be very focused and do work here in Maine, but that there's a realization that the work being done here in Maine absolutely is relevant to rural communities and island communities elsewhere. And so um, the Island Institute has partnerships in the Virgin Islands, the Outer Banks, the Gulf of Alaska, where we're actually moving community leaders around to share solutions about things like the cost of energy, things like how to conserve marine resources and that sort of thing. So this is a new mission statement in the last few years and I just thought it was worth spending a moment um, to bring you up to speed on it. So I'm curious um, about your community and what your concerns are. So I just have a couple of questions here. What are the things that you believe are some of the strongest assets that you have right here? I'm just curious what some of you, how you would answer that. <laughs> Sally says this library. <laughs> uh, yeah. The people. The people, how so? They're a wonderful group of people. Yeah. Um, they're very welcoming. Just everyone seems to have had the same reason for moving here, you know, 
it's hard to articulate. Mm -hmm. And people are inclusive and friendly and just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Volunteerism is strong. That's incredible, right? That doesn't exist everywhere. What, what else? Back here. I think people here have a, a particularly good sense of our history and uh, are, are eager to kind of preserve some kind of focus on that mm -hmm. and, and maybe draw from it, maybe to change themselves because of it. One of the most interesting um, things I learned when I came here was this kind of deep sense of the continuity of place, mm -hmm. which is really unlike when, when friends of mine come, I'm from the east side of Cleveland, right? So um, I've came from anywhere USA, and when I bring people here, and now that I've been here about 15 years, people are just so struck by the deep sense of continuity and understanding of where the where the communities came from. You know? Do you have your hand up? Yeah. I'm just going to piggyback on the people thing. I think that um, which goes along with what you're saying that um, with all the people who are mainers versus mm -hmm. those of us who are away people, from away, there's yeah. a support on each side, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because the from away people who come here and live here, you know, love it just like people who are born and bred here, mm -hmm. many generations to be a mainer. Yeah. So there's that understanding of each other. If you know, as a, an away person, you come with that feeling. Mm -hmm. You're not mm -hmm. here as just somebody to change it. You're here because you love it. Yeah. And, and if you show that and you work together, um, there's a mutual respect. Well, there's an entire skill set wrapped into figuring out how to do that without alienating yourself from everybody, right? right. Yeah. And the people who do come here to change it, the yeah, we seem to have a social norms in place that and, and encourage people to leave if they have those ideas. <laughs> and, and the Damascada community uh, has some advantages that others don't have. We're halfway between Brunswick and Rockland, mm -hmm. where you operate. We're a year-round community, unlike so many yes. of the coastal communities mm -hmm. that close up shop in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, this parking lot is as full in January is, is no. I should know the answer to this, but what is the year-round population here, do you think? 2,000 in Damascus. Okay. But it's a service community, so... Both peninsula. Both peninsula. Yeah, including both peninsula. Both peninsula. Yeah, I was going to say that's a big... This, this is town, town too. South Bristol. Yes. Okay. Anybody else on the what we like? Yeah. <coughs> I think it's so obvious we don't even mention it. How beautiful it is. I mean, in every season. So, yeah. I mean, friends here from away said, I came for the green. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazingly beautiful. And that, as you say, the sense that we don't want it to change mm -hmm. in essence. Mm -hmm. We want to keep that feeling. What about the concerns? What are, what are the concerns that are driving a lot of your um, kind of, if you have anxieties about the future? Yeah jobs yeah. for young people, especially keeping young people here. Keeping young people here, yeah. Creeping commercialism. Sorry, uh, say that again? Creeping, creeping commercialism. commercialism. Uh, I, I think of our battle with uh, to keep uh, uh, Walmart out of the town. Yeah, you guys did a good job. I mean, that would have just devastated the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other concerns? I think there are a lot of concerns about what's going to happen with the waterfront and Mm -hmm. And uh, as erosion continues, and mm -hmm. sometimes we're not the best stewards of, sure. of our wonderful resources. Yeah. I think that's a big concern. And we have a declining school age population. Lincoln Academy is filling the gaps like we're going to international students. Yeah. With the long range of so with the group, it's an older community. Yeah. Well, I guess I think you probably won't be surprised to know that those are the same when a few years ago when I went out and sat in island communities and asked these questions, those very same answers came back, right? Um, how are we going to attract and retain youth? Families that, how can we, and actually one of the things I haven't heard here which really comes up a lot is affordability yes. as a direct correlation to the attracting and retaining young families. Um, lots of concerns about the changing nature of the waterfront and 
the degree to which that's kind of characterizes the identity of the place and how that's changing. Um, you know, the, and the economic kind of narrowing of our economy is something that's causing a lot of people concern, right? And so that, um, these things I, I mostly wanted to just hear, I actually hadn't heard from folks in this community on, on these kinds of questions, but increasingly we're going to be asking these kinds of questions along the coast as well as on the islands and trying to find where the issues line up. Um, so there's a picture missing here, so I'm going to have to paint it. Um, it's when you steal images from the internet, sometimes they don't show. <laughs> so um, I came here from Yunnan, China, where I was a PhD researcher. And when I was living in Yunnan, China, I was living in a fairly spectacular remote terrace farm on the Vietnam border in Yunnan province in the southwest of China. Yunnan is, uh, it's, I mean, south of the clouds. It's an incredibly beautiful area. You have everything from the Tibetan plateau all the way down to the Mekong River in one province. Just incredible diversity, but you also have incredible cultural diversity. 23 Chinese minorities live in Yunnan province. And I was living with the Baidzu people in this village. And, um, and so, and it was really hard, and I got really sick, and I left. My wife and I had just gotten married, and we decided that if we were ever going to have a family and a house and try to live the American dream, it was at least a solid 12-year commitment to be in China to do decent PhD research, and I couldn't uh, I couldn't pull it off, right? So I left Yunnan, China, and these beautiful terrace farms, and the thing that I had been studying there was how do development efforts by international aid organizations and the Chinese government affect these rural minorities? And so you have these incredible, this incredible rich cultural milieu, and you have um, the only way for these people to become modern, to access money, to buy a television, or to buy a better form of transportation, or to be more connected to the world, was basically going to be to perform their culture forever, right? The, the Han Chinese really loved coming down to the southwest of China to take pictures of people singing and dancing, and wearing their costumes, and performing their culture. Um, this, and so they were recarving the landscape so the tour buses could get in, have a nice meal, take their pictures, see people in their native environment doing their native behavior. And it's called the Disneyfication of culture. It's a major part of, in fact, a lot of development strategies in rural places around the world. Right? This happens all over. And uh, so that's what I was studying. And I left. And I came to the coast of Maine, which is also really beautiful. Um, and what I came across when I, and I thought, I've left China behind, and I left all of that thinking behind. Right, because I didn't. I actually didn't come here to work at the Island Institute. I found the Island Institute once I was here, um, and I started writing for the newspaper. I was the grants writer at the organization 14 years ago, so I was having to justify our existence at the same time that I was trying to struggle with some of the challenges by writing about them. And I got involved in the York River Harbor Working Waterfront Preservation case, which at the time um, was a really um, forward-thinking partnership between Coastal Enterprises, the State of Maine. Um, the land trust down in York Harbor in that area, the, the historical society got involved, and um, they wanted to preserve a commercial fishing wharf. And they um, were struggling with what vehicle they could use to help these fishermen stay on the property because they were getting taxed so high that they could no longer afford their working waterfront access. And so how did that wharf get preserved? Well, if you looked at the state's regulations at the time that would allow for different kinds of preservation. There was no working waterfront preservation program back then. So you could preserve it for its cultural significance and its scenic beauty. And so um, if you look at the easement language that went into preserving that wharf in York Harbor, it will tell you exactly what the structures will have to look like in perpetuity. It will tell you the kinds of boats that can land there. I mean, it doesn't quite say what the fishermen will have to wear, but like it gets as close as you could possibly have to get to basically the same problem I was experiencing in China, which was that we're going to have fishermen here performing fishing for people in order to get access to money and stay on their historic properties, right? And it was startling to me to be able to see this connection 
And it made me really think hard about the value of the organization I was now a part of and kind of its potential to avoid a lot of the development outcomes that happen in other parts of the world. Um, so that's a little bit about me and um, what brought me here. I think, you know, because I'm an anthropologist by training, I get really uh, motivated by the struggle over who we're becoming as a coast, who we're becoming as communities, who we're becoming as, in terms of how we invest in infrastructure and what it says about what we want for the future. How do we invest in our schools? How do we invest in commercial fishing access? How do we write our laws? All of these things for me, as much as they are individual challenges that have lots of technical aspects to it, it's a huge identity project, in my mind, about what is the future of this coast going to be like? What will it be like to have meaningful work here? And will that work allow us to sustain a livelihood that, or will that work allow us to afford to be here, right? And so for the people who, this is a, actually, uh, you guys probably all noticed this is the Portland waterfront, but this is the Casco Bay Lines, you have the pizza flatbread here, you have a lot of recreational conversion going on over here. Portland Waterfront is just kind of the best example of this massive struggle, but um, it, by framing it in those terms, right, which is kind of a negative term and kind of a uh, tense kind of way of thinking about the coast, I think it's tr I'm trying to be very clear-eyed about the fact that um, all the things you described you loved and everything that you described you're concerned about are ongoing debates, right? That, and there are people on all sides very passionate, um, very committed to their outcomes. And the smaller the communities get, the more personal it all becomes, right? And so I don't, I want to kind of bring it to that level of understanding. It's just that um, as much as we may want housing that young people can afford, um, we also have a behavior, many behaviors that, uh, and many choices get made that make that nearly impossible. <laughs> Um, for a long-term outcome. So how do we how do we have those discussions? And I think you know um, this is uh, this is the uh, tip jar at my coffee shop in Rockland. Um, it's just I put it I took the picture because um, you know change is incredibly hard, right? It's um, you have uh, so one of the things that the founders taught me was that when somebody says something will never happen on the coast of Maine you got a solid 12-year battle ahead of you if you think that's, you know, if you really would like to see something happen and everybody's saying never, right? That, that, now that has good side and bad side. The good thing is that we probably change much slower and more deliberately than many other parts of the United States, and that's what makes this and keeps this place so special. And yet things like climate change and issues like um, the increased valuations of our community and our real estate and the way the real estate market works, work against us all the time, right? So what do we look like today and what will we look like tomorrow? Um, these are uh, kind of two different sections. This next section is gonna be a little data heavy and wonky, um, but I do think it's kind of, it'll give you as much a sense of kind of the questions that I'm being asked by community members and what they wanna know about how they look in the world and, you know, and it also, a little bit about, well, where are the opportunities to make change, make change happen that can hopefully uh, get at some of the concerns we all have. So where, you know, this is something you all know really well, but um, this is just, this is our coastline. Um, I don't know how many of you know, there's about 141 coastal municipalities. That goes all the way to the head of the, the tide, so that's why we have all of these um, you know, the Tidewater Coastal is, is on this map, although certainly um, it's very different to be in those places than it is to be in this greater Portland area. You can see the 15 year round island communities spread along the coast. Um, and, you know, basically, uh, this is also, as we're trying to understand kind of how we're all connected as a coastline, just trying to understand kind of where are the people that are able to make a difference and where are the communities that are more similar. And not surprisingly, you find that, you know, even in a community, if, even if these, both these peninsulas are 2,000 people, the biggest island is 1,200, Vinyl Haven, right? The smallest, Mont Montegan, Matinicus, and French Borough, they all fight that out, but it's basically 40 people 
is the smallest island community, the furthest offshore is Matinicus at 22 miles. Um, you know, that's an extreme case, but you know, North Haven and Vinyl Haven and Peaks and Shebig, they operate a lot like the peninsulas a lot of the time. I mean, even though there's a road connected, um, the fact that in Port Clyde you have 350 year-round residents um, at the end of the peninsula, you know, I had a, um, actually an astronomer tell me, he's like, you know, from space, peninsulas are just halfway out in every way to the islands. They're all connected, the families are related, and um, you can really think of it as just uh, a very much island did as a type of community. Um, so, that's a little bit of the census material. Um, oh, things, I'm just going to see what, I was going to, I have a couple notes on some of this stuff. Could you define Tidewater Coastal? So that's head of tide, Bangor, Lewiston, um, not Lewiston, oh. Auburn, um, here. Well, you can, these, the pink blocks, oh, pink. those are the, um, all the towns that are up at the top of the river systems in Maine. And for the State Department of Marine Resources, they all, in the state, Maine State Planning Office Coastal Program, those are all considered working waterfront. Um, because some of the great commercial paper and timber industry infrastructure is sitting up there. Um, from a practical Island Institute point of view, it doesn't make it a priority for us. It's just a, the way it's considered by the state of Maine. Um, you know, you also have these GDP estimates, which kind of gives you a sense of, of kind of the, the economic import of these places. Um, economic import, I don't know if that's an overstatement. I think it's just more the relativity of the economic activity, less so than its import. Um, but obviously, the islands with 5,000 people total in all 15 communities are not going to have the same kinds of economy as you would find everywhere else. Um, you know, the things that I wanted to talk to when I was up on the demographic slide is that, um, you know, and this is something I think we all know, but just to put it in numbers, the average age in the state of Maine is 47. This is much higher than the national average, which is around 39 or 40. The islands on the coast of Maine, the average age is 52. Um, this makes them the, as a subset of our coastal demographics, some of the oldest communities in the country. Um, and this, there's a, uh, when you talk about kind of who's here as young families and the people that are in the pipeline to fill our schools, there's something called a dependency ratio, which some of you might be familiar with. It is the, it's people who are below 18 and over 65. So the idea is that these are folks who aren't necessarily in the workforce. They're certainly not, dependency is not really a good word for it, but that's the way it's termed. Um, and that is, you know, so 63% of, of Maine coastal and island residents are outside of workforce age, right? Um, and so when you think about how to uh, sustain a community, you have to look that in the eye and say, how are we going to attract and retain young families? What sort of systems need, not, what sort of investments ought we make in order to allow that to happen? Um, on the economy front, you know, uh, I wanted to just give you a little bit of a sense of the narrowness of our economy. And, you know, I have to be careful because every community is so different, and obviously tourism is a major driver here. It's a major driver in Rockland and Camden. But commercial fisheries are much more of a driver outside of these towns that we live in. And so, um, you know, we have a lobster fishery. Well, I guess um, mostly to talk about how we've basically come to monocrop lobster as our economic base where we're connected to the marine environment. Um, in 1995, we landed 30 million pounds of ground fish in the state of Maine. Last year, we landed 1.8 million pounds. Um, urchins, which were a major fishery here. In 1995, we landed 34 million pounds. Last year, we landed 1.5 million pounds. Shrimp, um, three years ago, we landed 12 million pounds. It hasn't been commercially open since. Lobsters, in 1995, the state of Maine landed 37 million pounds total of lobster. This year we landed 127 million pounds. So we have, our marine economy has grown, but become completely, there's a total lack of diversity, right? I mean, it is 
startling and um, and we can talk about that with the time at the end if you want there's a lot of reasons for that but you know for somebody like me and I'm assuming many of you you know I would I probably wouldn't work at the Island Institute if if the communities on this coast didn't have a very meaningful relationship to the ocean right if if the ocean was there solely for its scenic beauty and we were supporting the sustainability of caretaking communities I wouldn't be here, right? Um, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, you haven't mentioned aquaculture. Does that fit into this? It's, uh, so, I, it does. I'm about to talk quite a bit about it. I mean, I, that's a, I think that's a huge part of the answer. I think a lot of people here would understand it that way. It's actually understood probably better here than anywhere else on the coast of Maine. So, um, but I do think that meaningful connection to the environment is fundamental, both to our identity, that sense of continuity, but also to having meaningful jobs that people, and frankly, friends and neighbors, who have meaningful livelihoods that can sustain them here. Um, the aquaculture industry is very nascent in Maine as a whole. Um, you, there are 1,300 acres of aquaculture cited in the state of Maine right now, um, and it's gotten a lot of press, uh, that would, but that amount, if you think about the ocean in front of us, or around us, um, that would fit in Rockland Harbor. It would fit at the Portland Jet Port. Um, it's very little. And about $100 million is generated in economic activity in the state of Maine from the aquaculture industry right now. 93% um, of that is coming from the salmon pens that are owned by Cook Aquaculture in Down East Maine. That's in a business that's run out of Canada by a family that uh, owns a great deal of salmon farm aquaculture. Um, and I think the, uh, so there are really bad numbers on the value of shellfish and kelp aquaculture in the state of Maine. That's, we're working with the DMR to fix that. The DMR estimates six to eight million dollars in economic activity from shellfish and kelp annually. Um, we think it's closer to 10 to 15 million currently. Um, and I think that's just a, a huge opportunity uh, for the growth. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, you know, what else is going on? This is just uh, employment. I think it's really important. A lot of us who've come from other places think about employment as if you go and get a job somewhere. The coast of Maine does not think about employment that way. 63% of island residents are self-employed. That number goes to 15% for the coast of Maine. It's more uh, like 3 to 4% nationally, people who are self-employed. Right, so people think about building industry here and where are all these folks gonna work? We might wanna think about our economic development strategies that really tailor to these kinds of small scale business development and self-employment and not so much to bringing in the next big jobs program that's gonna save this place because frankly, it's actually not built that way right now. We don't have that economy anywhere outside of Portland. It just, um, it doesn't really exist along our coast. Uh, energy, uh, these to me are some of the big underlying issues, right? So energy, the case in the in Maine, uh, Mainers are paying, you know, basically 8% of our average income goes to the cost of electricity and heating. That is enormously high. Um, the, this country as a whole averages 3% of their income going to heating and electricity. That undermines people's ability to afford to be here. It, you know, and when you think about the quality of housing and the age of housing on the coast of Maine and on the islands, it just is a real terrible situation. I mean, you have, so there's a lot that can be done there. Housing, um, where, I'm actually gonna just stop momentarily and just say, if you step back and said, this, I actually, I ran into a um, finance guy. He said like, and he's on a big island, he said, should be very concerned. We don't have a pipeline of kids coming into our school. And I, I thought this was really interesting from a business perspective. He said, what is the ideal size of our school for Shabig Island? And you know, you ask everybody in the community, say, eh, like 25, 30 kids, K-5, right? Small school. Um, so, so what are the parents of those kids gonna do to work? What sort of transportation needs to be in place to make sure they can do that work? What sort of infrastructure investments do we need to make in broadband so that they can be here? 
Um, what sort of housing will need to be there? What mix of age of people will we need in our community over time? And what will they do and what will they be able to afford? So what does the housing stock need to look like in order to support to always have 22 to 25 kids at that school? I've never heard anybody reverse engineer a, school, uh, a community sustainability idea from the kind of maximum or ideal carrying capacity of a school, but I actually think it's kind of overrated. And, very, um, and it might be something to take back to your discussions as you spend time in the community. You know, what do we need in order to have a school that will keep, be full? And I think uh, when you look at housing, uh, along the coast of Maine, and I'm, I really, the reason that map had Portland in a different color, like just, just take that out of everything I'm saying in terms of statistics, it does not apply. It's got its whole other set of statistics and a whole other reality. Um, but the average family on the coast of Maine can afford one half of the average price of a house, right? We can only afford people who are, have dual incomes that might be fishing and a teacher or in construction or doing all of the things that people are doing to get by, right? They can afford basically half of the average home price in these communities. That is a fundamental structural issue that every community needs to work on. And I know this community also has been very progressive on that front. I mean, you had Genesis's offices here. All these years, you have, you have one of the great housing organizations that have been right down the street. So um, I think like um, this is being worked on actively, but it is, it's an issue that will never go away at this point. You can't stop the way the real estate market works. Um, you know, more demand only increases the price. It does not create more, create more supply. And a lot of people get really caught up in debates about whether or not they really want affordable housing in their communities because of all of the bad ideas they have in their head about what it means in the urban place they might have come from, right? And so it just gets loaded with baggage and makes it almost impossible to have really good community dialogue. Um, but it's essential. Then I would say broadband is another major issue. Um, Maine as a whole, 12% of all Mainers have 10 megabit up and down service. The federal um, standard that was just set for what is required to have an effective ability to deal with healthcare needs, education needs, and so on and so forth in broadband is 25 megabits up and down. Um, and only 12% of Maine has 10. And when you get out to the peninsulas and coasts, it's, in, it's incredibly frustrating. I mean, I just spent the last two days on a boat on Isle Ho, French Borough, and the Cranberries, and then back to Rockland. And when I leave Rockland, it's done. Like, nobody can get me. It's fantastic. But, like, um, but it is, I mean, it's just, you know, when we, uh, we invested in a brewery on Monhegan, we have a loan and investment fund. Monhegan Brewery is one of our investments. Um, they can't run a credit card and post a social media post at the same time, right? That's, you know, in the world we live in today, that's just not acceptable. That's, that's, those are some of the, I mean, that's a very small example, but that is a very real example of constraining a very exciting small business from its potential, right? Um, all right, challenges, other challenges. Um, I just wanted to point this out. I was in Stockholm, Sweden, giving a paper at, uh, at a conference that I was invited over there, and I was rummaging through some literature they had out on their counter at the Resilience Center in Stockholm. And they had case studies of where are the least resilient economic and social systems in the world. And the number one case that they had identified was the social and economic basis of the coast of Maine. And that's a group in Stockholm who didn't even know I was shipping. Mean, they, 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 when we got talking, it was, I was shocked, right? I mean, we're right there with Borneo. I, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, what is the, you know, so it's, it really kind of in my mind, it's like, well, yes, we're here in the first world. We're in the United States. We're in this incredibly wealthy, well-connected part of the world. We should be able to take advantage of that wealth and the international connections we have and the thinking that's been done to show how you actually do it right and not just kind of fall prey to the same disasters that crush third world economies. 
you know, being totally dependent on one species and just waiting for a disease. Anyways, I'm like, that's a little bit of a soapbox thing for me. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we have obviously other things that we ought to be planning for. The ocean temperature is warming. I'm sure you've heard a lot about that from other speakers that have come through town. Sea level is rising um, and way faster than anybody is really talking about. Um, our, we have an oceanographer on staff, Heather Deese, and she was, uh, the new data is showing that it's going to be about eight inches every 10 years now. Potentially, now, depending on where you are, right? Gulf of Maine is this really unusual little tiny sea because of the way it's shaped in the ocean. It actually behaves much differently. But if I was in Washington, D.C., where they're creating the laws that are avoiding all this, like, they're actually going to be underwater in Washington, which will be ironic and some other things. But, um, <laughs> so, um, so what, you know, what are we going to look like tomorrow? That gets me excited. That wakes me up in the morning. You know, how can we take these resources and these opportunities to create the world we want to live in how can, you know, there, uh, this is, a, there's some folks, I think one of the things, you know, we're at the Island Institute, right, and it says Island Institute in our name, and, and yet, um, what I'm finding, which has been really encouraging, is that everywhere I go, people see the element of themselves and their community that has an island element to it, right? So, um, I, was, uh, I was in the High Sierra, in a very small town, where they wanted to replicate our Island Fellows program. Because, you know, it's, it's a half hour for them by road to anything. They're just out in the middle of nowhere, and they just said, you know, well, we're an island too. You know, and I mean, yes and no, but at the end of the day, in a lot of ways, yes. Um, and so, you know, what would we imagine the future to look like? Would we actually be better off if we learned something from the ways islands deal with kind of having completely limited uh, environmental boundaries and very tight-knit social networks. What could we learn from these communities that might help communities along the coast and elsewhere kind of grapple with change? And I think there's a lot of opportunity for that so that we can kind of avoid some of the negative elements of kind of the Portland outcome. You know, and that's just that's a, one of Peter's shots from off, off on the off there. Um, so, you know, this is like a very gratuitous shot. This is my son, and this is uh, um, this is his really good friend on Mile Haven, and they go fishing two times a summer. And um, but you know they're eight, and you know for me it's what what you know it's very personal. What is their career? What, what are they going to be able to do here? What's their life going to look like? You know, um, and so you know, fundamentally, we have to diversify beyond lobster, and I do think aquaculture is a huge part of the answer. Um, we have, uh, but you know, I do think, even though lobster stocks are inordinately high, higher than their historical averages, let's just say that they go down to 90 million pounds. The historic average is about 43 million pounds, so, um, which is frightening, but, Wild-caught fisheries in this world are becoming so incredibly rare that the species being caught are appreciating in value rapidly. So the estimates are that wild-caught species are going to continue to appreciate in value at the rate of about 25% each decade as they become increasingly hard to find. The lobster fishery, providing that we will have one, and we will, it may not look the same, it may be at a different part of the coast than it is today, you know, but it's going to exist, and it may continue to produce the $500 million that it produces today. It's not going to produce it for as many people, right? It's going to produce it for the folks who are really good at fishing, who are already on cash, living on cash, and are, you know, um, you know, it won't be the economic engine and job programs it is today, where, you know, you have 5,000, I'm sorry, 3,200 captains, all their crew, all the shoreside infrastructure that pulls it, you know, that when you put the multiplier effect on it, it's about a billion dollar industry in the state of Maine. So, I mean, we have a 20 billion dollar economy, so it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, but I do think we need to continue to innovate. Obviously, for, from our point of view, looking for examples of where people are doing really innovative things in the lobster industry that can allow people to extract more at the boat um, and leave, you know, things like what Luke's Lobster has done. They just bought a wharf in Tenants Harbor. 
the, this is Luke's Lobster the Lobster Roll place in D.C. and New York. Uh, Luke Holden's father was a processor in Portland. He grew up in Maine. Now he's in retail. So he's taking the lobster right from the wharfs to the restaurant and eliminating all kinds of middlemen in the process. One of the things we're looking at now, um, it's been looked at in the past, is a super co-op. So the co-ops in the state, lobster co-ops in the state of Maine land, you know, roughly 16 to 18 percent of the overall state's catch. Um, strangely enough, in the in the laws that exist, lobster co-ops could pair up with each other and create a super co-op for sharing pricing. It's legal. Um, we just had a bunch of legal work done on this that proves the case, and we're working with four different co-ops that are looking at piloting this idea, because if they could. You know, because what's happening is that um, processing is growing in the state of Maine. More and more processing is coming online. Especially Prospect Harbor just opened um, 100,000 new square feet of lobster processing in the state of Maine. And um, so they need product and they need it guaranteed and they're willing to pay for it. So price is going up. The more that fishermen co-ops could control that, the more they're going to glean in the end. And so we want to experiment with that with them. Um, Shellfish and kelp aquaculture, uh, we, uh, aquaculture, that 100 million is all in, salmon included. I put this number up there before I hit ground truth, that 200 million is actually too ambitious um, in kind of a 10 year period. We think we can definitely add the shellfish and kelp aquaculture and bring it from maybe up to 50 to 75 million in activity. Um, we have 19 people in a program at the Island Institute called the Aquaculture Business Development Program. That are all going to be in the water within the next. Um, well, we have five that are in the water now, and the rest of them should be in the water within the next nine months. Um, they're at their permit. We, we uh, aggregated the permit application process, put it through the DMR. But they're all people who are going into oysters, mussels, and kelp. Um, and they're all small business owners. Most of them are already fishing in the lobster industry. They're mostly from here south. And of Sam Belknap and his friends and all them set to south of here, people who have seen lobstering die off, or just not die off, seen it revert back to historical averages, right? And so they're not seeing the incredible paydays. And so they're thinking of things they can do on the margins. And the way we look at it from a, like the social science point of view is as soon as a few of these guys show up with new pickup trucks, everybody else will want in. And so, it, but it literally works that way, right? Like if somebody can say, I bought this truck because I had a shellfish farm or, or a kelp farm, kelp on the side during the winter, um, it will actually change the way people start to think about what marine work looks like in the future. So we're working with the early adopters, people who've done well and can take risks. Um, we're working quite a bit on the broadband issue now. Um, we have made this one of our highest organizational priorities because the economic impact of broadband could be astronomical. Um, I know on the islands we're working on the coastal data right now, but on the islands, if you made a $15 million investment in fiber to home broadband infrastructure, actually Islesboro just voted to do this um, two weeks ago, uh, that municipality is investing almost $3 million in fiber to home broadband. Um, the economic impact, if you put $15 million into that, is about $77 million over the first um, six years of the investment in terms of cost savings for medical and in terms of people's ability to work remotely and participate in the global economy and not have to rely on the more traditional modes of economic activity here. Now those numbers are based on um, studies that have been done by Tilson Technology which has done this work in other parts of the country. So they're looking at other similar rural areas and projecting onto the islands what the economic benefit would be. You know, we have to, um, this is ultimately a, uh, an, an experiment, right? We don't know. But I do think we are finding many more um, technology workers that are interested in living on the islands if they could have the access to these kinds of speeds. Um, energy, as I mentioned, how can we bring the cost of energy um, back in line with national averages? National averages may be too ambitious. Um, you know, we are at the end of the pipeline in so many ways. Um, you know, up where, I don't even, do you guys have, a, the natural gas line doesn't even make it here, it stops. Yeah, so, um, so we're not benefiting from any of that. <laughs> 
You know, a lot of people are heavy heating with fuel oil still. Um, and so, you know, for us, we're starting quite a bit with efficiency measures. You can actually, uh, we're working with the state of Maine now to create kind of an aggregated efficiency program. And what that means is that um, in remote communities, uh, so down the peninsulas, on the islands, and in Washington County, up in Aroostook, um, you won't find it worthwhile for somebody to buy the truck get the equipment to do the blower door test, to do the foam insulating. All that stuff takes expertise and human capacity that small communities often can't afford to have themselves. It's not even sustainable for somebody to go into that business. So what we're doing is we've created these things called weatherization weeks, where we'll pull together an entire, anybody who wants to step forward to get their house um, insulated, we'll bring in a contractor to spend a week in a community hitting as many houses as possible. And that makes it worthwhile to the contractor and it makes it worthwhile to the community members and then we're working to um, working with state incentive programs to try to put those to work through efficiency main trust. Are you doing yeah. anything with solar or wind power institute? Are you Yeah, so you know, we started well, we you know we were very involved in the Fox Island Wind project. We um, we had an incredibly uh, strong role in community process, in sorting out the financing model, um, in the regulatory process. We were very involved, um, and it worked for that community. Their pr their energy prices are what they had anticipated being. The energy is being produced by those turbines. It's a success story on those islands. But a $15 million community-owned investment is very hard for a community to make. Um, it is very hard for communities of a smaller size to have the local technical expertise to manage a project of that nature and scope. And so um, after we did that project and, and after Swans asked us to scope a project on their island, um, we looked at Monhegan for a small scale wind project on the island, like these were requests that came to us. Um, well, what happened? Solar became much more affordable, for starters. Um, the local capacity issues were hard to overcome for something so technical and complex as wind. Um, and so we're really looking now at very practical community by community approaches that start with efficiency and then move to renewables. but. You know, in a lot of cases, you're moving to renewables from a diesel generator setup that's pretty old. And so you need to use pretty creative government funding to put in the switch gears to integrate with intermittent solar. Um, Monhegan, we're doing that right now. So we're doing an integrated diesel solar program on Monhegan to try to help them bring their costs down. Um, we've been working with Matinicus on the same thing. The, the, the non-grid tied islands are in a very different, more precarious place than the rest of us. They're paying between you know, 30 and 70 cents a kilowatt hour. You and I are paying 10 to 13. So those are a high focus for us. Um, I also know I'm running out of time. Um, go ahead. Just briefly, is there any uh, development of uh, the tidal energy? As a, is there any optimism that that might be beneficial to the area, considering how strong the tides are around here? Yeah. Um, it's not, it's not develop, fully developed yet. Um, the, the, what is developed, the ORPC, Ocean Renewable Power Company, that uh, started out in Eastport and is based out of Portland, is now doing river system, applying that technology in river systems in Alaska with native communities. Um, but it hasn't, it's very early in its development and has never met, well, I should say, um, not too many communities want to be the testing ground. <laughs> because, you know, especially where we're working, you can't really, as much as islands present this amazing opportunity to learn about these finite systems and tech, new technology, how to apply new technology, um, you can't experiment on people's energy and have it go out. <laughs> right? So, um, Tidal, we looked at it on Vinyl Haven years ago. Swans Island looked at it. It's, we brought technology out to test it. It constantly got chewed up and destroyed. We, we've not, it's not there yet for, um, as a real, I should say, we look for community scale solutions. Another kind of, I'm just gonna move to the Q&A. We could just, you know, we're talk now. 
Um, <laughs> um, we look for community solutions. Um, and this is really part of the island training of the organization. The reason there's a wind project on Vinyl Haven, some of you may or may not know, is because the school actually looked at going off the grid. The school there was paying such high energy costs that it looked at, it put up a MET tower, tested the wind, and looked at producing its own energy. Well, that community has an electric co-op. What that means is that the ratepayers are the owners. So you have around 1,300 ratepayers on North Haven and Vinyl Haven of the Fox Island Electric Co-op. Every time somebody builds a really green house, puts in all the right light bulbs, and buys all the right appliances, their cost of electricity goes down. But the co-op still needs to make its money. So all those costs get redistributed out to the people who can't pay as much or put in as nice as stuff, right? That, um, and so we needed a solution that would actually work for everybody. And when the school did that, it, I mean, it was like, oh my God, if the school goes off the grid, all those carrying costs for the energy in that community are gonna get foisted on everybody else. Nobody can afford that, even though it's the right thing to do, right, is to go green, right? And so how could going green create this massive kind of inequality? And that was what was, could have happened. And in a way, I mean, you can actually scale that exact same problem to the national grid, frankly. Where it's produced, how it's produced, who gets it cheaply and who doesn't, is actually just a massive island question. Um, so yeah, so, um, so I'm, not even, I'm talking about our role while we're talking now, so I don't need to talk about it you know, by going through bullets. Um, you know, what other, kinds of, uh, what other kinds of thoughts did this provoke for you? What, um, some of this discussion, what does it make you think about what ought to be some of the focus of the discussion here in your community? Uh, yeah. Well, just uh, 40 years ago, a company called MOOC started to go to lease yeah. and start a room. Yeah. And, uh, that, that, and it, it's grown and grown. I don't know how many leases there are now. And I don't know if the value of the catch is, but it's huge because uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you got you got legal seafood all over the country. They get right. famous by River oysters. So yeah. I think that's the, that that's kind of an industry that, that can employ young people. Mm -hmm. uh, with, with, at the school, Lincoln Academy, they've got now some sort of a, a trade trade truck, you may call it. Yeah. For men and women, by the way, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, there are things. Kevin got a good point. How do you keep young people here? Mm -hmm. It's a great place to live. It's a great community, but you've got to keep them employed somehow. And I think this town is doing well in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, Neo, yeah, yeah. Now you guys are really early on this compared to the rest of the coast. There have been uh, so much kind of early damage done because of other kinds of farming, fish farming along the coast, to community um, community perception, mm -hmm. right? So citing aquaculture is very hard in Maine still. It's becoming less hard when you start to look at shellfish and kelp and things that are known to be good for the water column, known to be economically viable. Um, but I do think we still have a lot of work to do and, and because Darling is down here and Dana Morris is down here and you guys have some of the most talented people in the state living in your community, those folks are actually now being asked to consult with like our business development program. You know, Dana comes up and talks about things like um, uh, bioremediation and looking, trying to make sure that what's produced is safe. You know, we don't want to damage the brand of oysters in Maine by having new harvesters go in um, and that could get somebody sick, right? Like we, we want to be really careful about that. We want to be careful that we learn from how siting has been done well here so that when we go into other communities we can do it well. I mean, this really it, it kind of under scores the value of that shift in our mission statement, right? Like, where can we be learning from each other to benefit for the coast of Maine? Not all the answers are on an island, and in, you know, the people in the, those communities are recognizing now that you need to learn from elsewhere. I mean, people, I should say, people have always known that, but there's been a huge shift in the last decade from, in Maine, the coast in general, from kind of, we have what we need, looking inward, we just need to have more people who are already here having more babies and we'll be all right <laughs> to kind of like, you know, to kind of, well, how are we going to attract people here? And I think that's the other p potential of shellfish and kelp. It doesn't have to have been somebody who
grew up fishing here, you can go in, and that's a huge threat to the lobster industry, perceived as a huge threat. Um, but I do think it's a, you know, you look at the guys all around Big Island that are, are doing different sorts of farming, and um, only one of them is a lobster inn. The rest of them are either seasonal residents or people who moved here who wanted to farm and didn't, hadn't really thought about this kind of farming, but it's great. I mean, it's, it's so much easier for a fisherman who already has the boat, knows how to be on the water, you know, has the rope, has every, you know, has tons of gear in place. Yep. A political question. Is yep. the state and its agencies helping or hindering your agenda? It's pretty amazing. I mean, I'm on film. Um, so <laughs> I think the way I'm going to answer, so here's how I would answer it. And this is, um, the agencies are pretty spectacular. I don't want to say that as an overarching statement, but DMR is, is a wonderful agency to work with. Um, great leadership. Very supportive of this stuff. Um, you know, I think energy has been trickier, you know, um, and that's just going to stay that way. Uh, but, you know, I think Pat Woodcock in the energy office is really good. He came out of Snow's office. He's incredibly talented. Um, you know, I think we're actually, yeah, I have to say, we're pretty, um, not, we're not a partisan organization. We work very hard to stay in the middle politically. Our issues are primarily economic now, and those resonate across the aisle fairly well. Um, so I guess that's, I, we've had success. In fact, it's kind of felt like pretty strange bedfellow kind of stuff. Like we didn't expect I think we're doing much better than most environmental groups because of the way we're focused on economic diversification as a major thrust of the organization. It just doesn't run into kind of the conservation hangups that I think exist in state agencies right now. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about, as you speak about working with others, um, we, as you mentioned earlier, haven't had Maine shrimp for a few yeah. years now. and we can go into a restaurant and have what looks like main trip, but it's Canadian trip. Right, yeah. And, and it's just interesting that they have it shut yeah. down so, as we have. And, and, you know, that's an issue. Yeah, it's, um, so that's, a, that's an impact. It's one of, um, so I am not an expert on this, but we were at the very southern end of the main shrimp, of, of oh, the okay. northern shrimp mm -hmm. territory to begin with. The waters have been warmer. So they may yeah. not come back. Yeah. I have to say, I've also talked to enough fishermen that, you know, so shrimp um, regenerate on a three-year cycle. Yeah. And it's entirely possible that it can rebuild, but not unless we have sustained colder waters. Okay. Right? Um, they also, frankly, it, it's not a well-managed fishery in Maine. And so not only were we at the southern end of their range when uh, the ocean became incredibly warm in 2012. It was exactly the same time that fishermen piled into that fishery and overshot the quotas by significant percentages. So it was a kind of perfect storm. And it's kind of an old story, unfortunately. Right? We just keep having this happen when we don't have strong fisheries management. Yeah. Uh, the Damascata region here in Pemaquid uh, Peninsula is very strong in the creative uh, arts, mm -hmm. and I wonder if uh, how much of a impact the creative community might have on the coastal region. Is that something that you're addressing at all, or um, I, to, to the extent that we're addressing it right now, um, we we support artists through our store, Archipelago, um, and we do our best to kind of represent and give an audience to artists uh, through our Main Street location. Uh, we also run an Island Artist Conference. It's now an Island and Coastal Artist Conference. So last year we had over 100 artists in Belfast that were at the, at the Hutchinson Center. And we're convening those folks to work on online marketing, to work on small business management skills, you know, helping them become more effective small business people because we see it as a absolutely fundamental aspect of our future economy, um, but we're dealing with it more through small business support 
then, um, or I should say, that is how we're dealing with it, is to say, that's what, that's kind of how they asked us to, and through Archipelago, we learned just it's very hard, and you know, it, it links right back to the broadband question. Try to have a website where you're going to upload the images of your artwork from some of the ends of these peninsulas, right? We have artists who actually have to come into Rockland to load their images onto their website and then go back out into the, wherever they're from, to, um, you know, that's, that's not good for business, and it's not good for the arts community. So um, they're recognizing that and getting more engaged in trying to help solve some of these problems. Um, well, hey, I'm going to be here, I'll stick around. There's some newspapers. Um, thanks you to those of you who are already members of the organization. I really appreciate it. We do we are our organization and support and value and support we can get. So thank you.